You know the status quo of brands these days? Honda still sells a shit ton of bikes, BMW is the master of precision, and KTM does whatever they want. But have you ever wondered how did these companies start? Well, I did. So welcome to a new series on Crankit. Welcome to Origins. In 1934, an Austrian engineer called Johann Trunkenpols set up a car repair shop in the small town of Mattikofen. Business starts to get some traction, and by 1937, he's already selling DKW motorcycles and Opel cars. One thing a lot of brands have in common is that almost none started out as being a motorcycle company, but somehow here they are. Back then, there was no KTM. Things were simpler. It was simply called Kraftfahrzeug Trunkenpolz Matikofen. Although, to be fair, this name never actually got registered. Unfortunately, a few years later, the Second World War hit. People were dying, economies were collapsing, but not KTMs. The thing is, they were still an automotive repair shop and they started specializing in diesel engine repairs. And as long as the war lasted, the repairs were in high demand. Luckily, the war ended and a lot of people were finally feeling relief. A lot of people except trunk and poles. In a Germany and Austria that was decimated by the consequences of an act of war, people weren't having money, there was nothing to repair, and the company was rapidly sinking. That's when the idea of building two-wheeled vehicles comes into play. These vehicles are cheaper to operate than usual cars, so there might be a chance that the business could stay afloat. Nineteen fifty one hits, and with it, the KTM R one hundred is unveiled, the company's first prototype motorcycle. All components were produced in house. This was not the parts been special. It's all except the engine, which was a Rotax unit. But the Austrian manufacturer had a good enough reputation in this field. Plus, building its own power plant would be a little too much of an effort for trunk and poles. In order to expand his business, our founder teams up with Ernst Kornheif, a well-known businessman. They team up and Ernst becomes a major shareholder, so major in fact that they renamed the company to Kronheim and Trunkenpolz Matikhofen. With the financial efforts of the Austrian businessman, KTM introduces two new models, the R125 Tourist and Grand Tourist. And also a new scooter called the Mirabelle was introduced. At that time, the focus still was on producing affordable motorcycles that would sell to the masses. In a spectacular manner, the exact same year, the newly announced bikes already win their first ever racing title in the 125cc national championship. KTM started to shed some blood in the racing scene and man did they enjoy the taste of it. This is why just two years later, after signing up to the six days trials, Egon Dornauer manages to win the gold medal on a KTM. The first ever appearance of this obscure brand in the contest already awarded them the top of the podium. Inspired by this success, they released their first ever sport motorcycle, the Trophy 125. At this point, it might seem that KTM was riding high. It seems that things were going well. Except in 1959, KTM decides to stop their motorcycle production, deciding to focus solely on mopeds and scooters. And one year later, the investor that helped them grow, unfortunately, dies. To add some salt to the wound, just two years after that, Trunk and Poles dies as well. His legacy is taken over by his son, Eric. A lot of companies start to demise after their initial founder dies, but that was not the case here. Eric managed to make quite some advancements, and in 1970, KTM starts producing their own in-house engines, transitioning over from the SACS units they used to use. This transition pays off, since four years later, KTM manages to win its first ever motocross championship. And this would be far from their last. The firsts continue, and in 1986, the first dirt bike with disc brakes, both front and rear, is released, and it carries the trunk and pulse badge on it. With these advancements, the company started to see a real decline in their moped sales. So both that division and the scooter division get dropped. That was it. From now on, KTM would only focus on motorcycles and racing. Sounds familiar? Unfortunately, this move didn't necessarily bring Eric a lot of budget to work with. In fact, things were far from being pink. Just one year later, in 1989, Eric Trunkenpolz dies. An Austrian politician going by the name of Josef Taus tries to take over the company to turn it around, but ultimately it fails. From this fail, though, arise one of KTM's most legendary bikes, the 300cc two-stroke. This bike was far from the steed we know today. It was plagued with issues, and that's why, at the end of the day, 
didn't really help KTM's bottom line. One year later, the inevitable happens. The Austrian company files for bankruptcy and the management is transferred to a consortium of banks. It's also when the company is split into four divisions, motorcycles, bicycles, radiators and tooling. Somehow being owned by a consortium of banks sounds like a terrible idea, but it started the ascent of the company towards the behemoth that it is today. In 1992, KTM Sport Motorcycle GmbH introduces new models and also starts to get really serious about racing. As the old saying goes, winning races on a Sunday sells bikes on Mondays. And this is a mantra that KTM has never really left behind. Two years later, the Duke is born, one of KTM's best successes, a line that still carries up to today. And in the same year, the Austrians also decided to sign up for a small rally you might have heard of called the Dakar. They improved up to the point where in 1998, every bike between 2nd and 12th place were KTM's. And this? This was just the beginning. The true skirmish starts in 2001, when Fabrizio Meoni wins the Paris Dakar rally riding an orange-made motorcycle. For a full 19-year period, no other manufacturer could even dream of ever reaching the top spot on the podium. The question wasn't if KTM was going to win, it was which KTM rider would win. His domination still stands as one of the longest brand winning streaks in motorcycle history. But let's go back a little, back to 1995 where we left off. In order to produce more in-house components, Husaberg and wide power suspension get acquired. Soon after, the legendary LC4 engine comes to life and it brings in an interesting innovation. A bike with such a large single cylinder that now came with an electric starter. And this is the year where the iconic orange livery becomes a thing. Starting this year, all KTM competition motorcycles would come with the iconic orange paintwork and bold letters. They also developed the PDS Shock, a feature still seen in modern day KTM Enduro motorcycles like the 300 DXE. It's the 2000s, 2003 to be more precise. This is the year when KTM officially got into road racing. Backed by another local brand you might have heard of, Red Bull, the manufacturer enters the 125cc MotoGP class. Just four years later, they form a new class as part of this championship, a class called the Rookies Cup. Here, KTM would be the sole provider of motorcycles. You can see where this is going, can you? In 2009, KTM ties for the winning IDM, a German motorcycle championship. Three years later, they managed to also snag Moto3 as a manufacturer's championship. All this leads to the inevitable, and in 2015, the KTM MotoGP team is born, again backed by the long collaborator, Red Bull. Nobody gave them any hopes. Most people were saying they should stay to their off-road routes, but they didn't. And this determination made them win three races in 2020 on a bespoke bike. Nobody used the trellis frame. Nobody used any other suspension rather than Olin's. Nobody except KTM. And it worked! In fact, it worked so well that it brought its satellite team, Tech Free, their happiest days in about 30 years. Tech Free has been racing for a long time, but were never good enough to win a race. That changed when they signed over from Yamaha to KTM, and in 2020, Miguel Oliveira managed to bring their first win ever as a racing team. First win in over 30 years. And not only that, he doubled that win in Portimao, the last round of the calendar. And even more, all these wins managed to get KTM up to fourth in the overall Constructors' Championship, just four points behind the Yamaha. You beauty, a blazing victory for Binder, a new star is born! In arguably the most difficult to enter to with motorsport, KTM was coming in fast. But again, we rushed a little here. Let's go back to 2003, where other than racing, some truly legendary motorcycles came to life. The 950 Adventure and the 990 Super Duke. In fact, in 2004, KTM was in talks to provide two out-of-work actors motorcycles for a pretty unique trip across Eurasia and North America. Unfortunately, they dropped the project. And I'm saying unfortunately because that project became a little show presented by Charlie Borman and Ewan McGregor called The Long Way Round. It makes you wonder, what if they rode orange? Would the BMW GS still be what it is today? I guess we'll never know. Either way, the company is expanding and in 2007, Indian manufacturer Baja buys a 14.5% stake. In 2013, they go ahead and purchase another familiar company, Husqvarna. Husky was a company created by leftover engineers that used to work for Husseberg and now it became a big part of KTM. One year later, they launched a motorcycle that redefined street bikes. 
KTM 1290 Super Duke R. I already have a video on that, so I'm not going to go too deep into it. We talked earlier about their focus on racing and they never really stopped. That's why by 2016 they had 96 MXGP, MX1 and MX2 world titles and Super Enduro titles. Now, no matter how you take it, that's quite a lot. So where are we now? In 2021, KTM owns both Husqvarna and Gas Gas. They all manufacture dirt bikes based on the same platform, but somehow manage to tailor every brand for a specific type of rider. And it works. Racing is still a huge part of this brand. Almost every motorsport branch they enter, they either dominated at one point or were at the top. Their motto is ready to race, and so far, they lived by it, and they don't show any signs of stopping. <laughs> 